This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, we're going to keep this botching Afghanistan series going with our next guest, Eric Blem. So you should know that name because he was on episode 186 of this podcast. He is the author of my favorite book of all time, Fearless. That's the story of Adam Brown, a Navy SEAL that was killed overseas. And here's the thing about his perspective on what's going on in Afghanistan. He spent a ton of time with people that served over there. And he spent a ton, ton of time with Gold Star families and Gold Star widows that have lost their people, lost their, their favorite people, their spouses, their loved ones over in Afghanistan. So he's uniquely suited to talk about what a lot of people are feeling right now. There's a lot of Gold Star families in America that are hurting, that they feel like they've been completely ran roughshod over, that their feelings aren't being taken into account, and that all these old wounds are coming right back up. So I really appreciated Eric's answers to a lot of these questions because he didn't just kind of keep it just to Afghanistan. He did kind of traverse into some other different subject matters, and he really let loose in a lot of areas, which I really appreciate. And again, guys, we're not doing any frills on this series, so let's go ahead and get into it. All right, Eric Blim, thank you so much for coming back on the show. I know we don't have the normal fanfare that we have for a lot of our episodes, but you know, obviously the current situation that we're in warrants that. And I say that we're in, we're sitting here stateside, you know, just basically watching all this unfold on the news and on Twitter. But from your perspective, obviously you've spent a lot of time with military members that were active duty, a lot of military members that, you know, are retired with Gold Star families, with, with other people that have been in the support system. So you've had a lot of tendrils spread out into the areas that are directly affected by what has happened in Afghanistan. But obviously, you know, a lot of people that are hurting right now because of what's happened just in the last 48 hours. So I'm just going to back away from the mic and give you some space to just give me some of your initial thoughts and we'll go from there. Uh, Matt, thank you. Uh, It's just, I'm just at a loss. I just cannot believe what we're seeing unfold. It's it's almost as bizarre as, I don't know, the morning of 9-11, you know, where you're just watching and you're like, I can't believe what I'm seeing. And uh, definitely having, you know, written stories about, uh, you know, people who have fallen during that, you know, this last past 20 years and their family members, it's just, it's heartbreaking at the end of the day. And it's heartbreaking to think of all of the Afghans who supported us and um, in the beginning. And then, you know, we, we chose uh, the route to stay in country. And so for 20 years, they've been, you know, interlinked with with our system and we basically i will say joe biden's administration has abandoned them and it just did not have to happen uh so i think the first thing i'd love to say is just first of all the mil- this is not a military failure uh it is an administrative failure a breakdown of uh of just in- it, i don't know what intelligence i mean these are things that were for prophesized, foretold, predictable, 100%. And the fact that they enacted this withdrawal as they have is just, um, it's entirely predictable. You know, either either uh, Biden and his administration ignored uh, the uh, warnings um, or chose not to take heed what his advisors told him, or worse, was there, is there such a breakdown in communication within the Biden administration that the information never got to him? And that, to me, shows the deep flaws in the Biden administration. And it's for the whole public to see this, um, this exit plan should have never gotten the green light as it was attempted to be executed. Um, but it, I mean, I don't know. I've been, you know, I've been glued to the television and, and, and it's not surprising either, as you learn. I mean, Robert Gates, who was secretary of defense for, you know, Bush and then also the Obama administration, he he wrote it's been quoted all over the place, um, probably being redundant for your listeners. But he wrote that Biden was wrong on nearly every major foreign policy and national security issue over the past four decades. And when they asked him before, when he was running for president, they asked him, is he going to be a good president? He could not answer that. He said, he right. said I don't right. know. And so, um, and so remember, on top of that, what makes it more frustrating is remember, um, not only as, as, this, as he orders this most disastrous exit of a military force in modern history, um, the one clear victory that we can look back on was following through with the original goal to hunt down and kill Osama bin Laden. 
who was, you know, for some of the people that that name comes up and they don't even realize that is the mastermind behind the 9-11 attacks. And um, Joe Biden voted against greenlighting that mission. The exactly. One, the one right. the one victory in all of this. So anyways, it's just it's frustrating. Um, it's not surprising, sadly. But uh, I think today, I think uh, a lot of us out there, you know, uh, fathers, mothers, grandparents, we're watching our grandchildren, our children go to school today. I, I sent off my um, daughter, fifth grader today to school. And as Holly mentioned on her podcast, who, you know, she's, uh, she is a badass, you know, fearlessly um, standing up for human rights and women's uh, rights, especially in Afghanistan. She's there right now. And she mentioned in there how for 20 years, an entire generation, there's, uh, you know, families have sent their daughters and sons off to school. Um, and there's dreams, there's goals, there's aspirations for of, of women, you know, going to college and uh, becoming whatever they might want to become in life. And this morning, all of a sudden, after one weekend of, of a horrible decision, they're not going to school. Could you imagine that? Imagine you have a 20 year old who was born around 9-11 and is in college right now or, or you know, even a, a five year old wanting to go off. And it's like, OK, well, your brother can go to school this morning, but you can't. And by the way, if you're going to leave the house, you're going to have to be covered or accompanied by a male member of the house, either my, your father or a brother. If not, you're staying in the house. It's basically COVID lockdown forever. And I just think it's just uh, it's just horrible. And it's um, yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. Yeah, I'm shocked as well. But I mean, you brought up a lot of good things there, Eric. But I mean, I've, I forget what the actual name for this phrase is, but essentially it's don't attribute to malice what you can attribute to ignorance. But this situation and how it was handled by the Biden administration was so beyond the point of ignorant. And the buck has to stop somewhere, because if you watch Joe Biden's comments yesterday at his press conference, it was egregious. It was absolutely egregious for a commander in chief to basically take no responsibility whatsoever. Because here's the thing is, you, if you want to pass blame around, you can talk about the Joint Chiefs, you can talk about the generals, you can talk about all these different people. But apparently all those people told him, don't do this. Like, whatever yeah. you do, don't do this. And Dan Crenshaw may have said it best. He's like, all Biden had to do was nothing. All he had to do was nothing. And this situation right. was going to take care of itself. And But I, right. I do want to kind of key in on something that you said a second ago. I, I jotted down a note here. You mentioned just briefly the, the allies that we had there on the ground. So this is going to be the interpreters, any of the informants, any of the people that basically allowed us to help them. Currently, the Taliban reportedly is systematically going door to door looking for those people and publicly executing them. So what are your thoughts, Eric, about because I know as an author, you, you take in a lot of research and you kind of coalesce everything into a narrative form. But you do understand history and how that is going to potentially have an impact on the future. What does this mean for foreign policy for the United States government over the next several decades, knowing that the Kurds shouldn't trust us. The Afghans shouldn't trust us. No, no one else in that area should trust us. I mean, are we a generation removed away from being able to hit the reset button here, or am I being a little bit too crazy? Well, you know, it, it it's interesting because in the world, you know, they look at America as it's one. It's it's almost like its own entity. Um, here in America, we're looking at and blaming Joe Biden. You know. Um, and the Biden administration, we can see that this is a temporary thing. And, you know, in four years, that could be very different. But you still have your track record in the world as America as a whole. And so, you know, there's going to be some um, crossover and all that. And, you know, those it just depends around the world. Depends where you get your news. I mean, there's people there's I'm sure just like here in America, depends where you get your news. And I think if anything, there's no doubt that it's not going to help us in any way. It's, it's going to definitely harm our reputation. Um, I mean, uh, you look at it, I mean, the Afghan people did, um, uh, they did fight for themselves. This is, his whole thing was, oh, they didn't stand and fight for themselves. Wrong. I mean, I don't know if anybody watched out there, the MSNBC, when they were interviewing the CIA analyst, who right. just uh, blew, uh, who was he talking to? Um, uh, Brian Williams, who, who basically... Right who keyed in on the one single line that could make Biden look okay saying, well, Biden owned it. He said the buck stops here. And the guy went, no, 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 no. You know, you basically put it off on everybody else, including the Afghan army who uh, for the past, you know, since 2014, I think is the date. I could be wrong. Maybe it's the entire, since um, 
no one but I mean, forty or fifty thousand Afghans have died. Fifty thousand Afghans have died since two thousand and fourteen. Yes, two thousand fourteen. Okay, so you have that, and then you look at our situation. Uh, in the last eighteen months, we've lost, I think, zero um, in Afghanistan, and. You know, I interviewed uh, and even I followed up knowing I was going to be on this podcast uh, with Jason Amarin, who was the captain of ODA 574, you know, Mm -hmm. one of the first special forces teams in. And he um, he said this was just um, just just stupid uh, the the way this was taken on. And he's usually a pretty measured, you know, individual as far as that goes in any policy. It was just, you know, just uh, gloriously stupid how it went about this, because in in reality, 2,500 people. Uh, to keep that footprint there, which was all it took to not win, Mm -hmm. not to defeat the Taliban, but to keep them in, uh, as it's been told, a stalemate, you know, a tie basically that allowed the country to move forward and have this freedom that they've had for the past 20 years. So I think a lot of people agree, yeah, we can't be there fighting a war for 20 years, but hey, we've had a giant base in Germany. We've had giant bases in Japan. We have 28,000 people on South Korea. Mm -hmm. Those are presences that we've kept. We didn't keep a presence in Vietnam because we got run out. We didn't get run out of Afghanistan. We left willingly. And that's where the travesty is because the way it was executed was just, just wrong. And it is uh, going back to your mention of all the people that supported us. We abandoned so many people who helped us along the way and not necessarily helped us. We helped them help themselves. We gave them the courage without very much of a footprint. I mean, the, the losses that we're going to incur because of this are going to far exceed what might have happened maybe for decades for us with a, to keep a small force there. And, yeah, and the, um, it's just, uh, it's, 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 it's frustrating. I mean, I'm frustrated. It's just, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated for the families who lost people there who had personal relationships with the Afghans who we, who they would say, they would go on the line and they say, you know, we promise we will not abandon you. And, you know, we wanted to get them set up. But at the end of the day, that's what Joe Biden has done. And he cannot put it off on anybody. He can't put it off on Trump. He can't put it off on um, (laughs) Obama. He can't put it off on Bush. Yeah, he inherited this, but he is executing this. All right. Sorry, we cut out a little bit. So for any of you wondering out there thinking that you found a uh, Easter egg, no, uh, we're, we're doing a new session here. That's why he doesn't have his headphones on this time. But one <laughs> thing that you talked about is I'm not sure if you talked about this uh, off air when you and I were talking before or if you were talking about it beforehand, but just how angry you are at all this. And in just 30 minutes before I hopped on the call with you, I was talking to a friend of mine that said, you know, he's waking up in the middle of the night, just angry. And we're we're both civilians and we're both finding it hard to like concentrate today and hard to like figure out where our emotions are on this. And I heard somebody, he was actually on the Dan Crenshaw podcast earlier this week. He's like, he's going back and forth between the feeling of wanting to grab his kit and grab his buddies and go hop on a flight and go over there and try to do something about it or curling up under his bed with a bottle of bourbon. And there's kind of these warring feelings but for you as a civilian that has spent so much time with military members and their families, you know, explain kind of that emotion right now of kind of being back and forth between anger and sadness. I think it, I think it hits close to home because exactly because of that, because you get, you know, emotionally involved with, you know, the losses of our men and women who have, who have fought and, and given so much in order to help give the Afghan people more of what we, many of us take for granted here. You know, the freedoms, the basic freedoms, like literally our kids going to school. And that is um, and it just it makes you angry when you know that it could have been done in a way that allowed that to continue. And I think for that small, I mean, we could go back and discuss the the debate of whether we should have stayed there all these years. Uh, That's kind of a moot point, because the point is we did stay there all these years. We did move forward with with the policy, whether you call it nation building or whatever you want to call it, that kept us there all these years. But at the end of the, at the end of the day, I believe that that was, uh, it's because as Americans, I mean, we're, we are decent people, despite our flaws and our, our, um, you know, the fact of what's going on that in fighting that the pandemic has started. And I will say that the media fuels, uh, between all of us at the end of the day, we want, other people to enjoy the same freedoms that we enjoy. Um, And that is, uh, you know, important. And so when you see that taken away, something that we basically have helped instill over there all these years and that what we've fought for and what we've lost, 
Um, it's not like, hey, we're going to fight forever. I think, yeah, is it right to get out to stop fighting the, the, the so-called war? But the reality is, and from what I understand, you know, it was a pretty small um, commitment comparatively for the gain that it gave us, allowed us that foothold there. What's, what's going to happen now? Al Qaeda, other terrorist network groups, ISIS, who knows what, uh, will move in. Uh, the Chinese will come in and, and mine their their minerals and their precious metals and everything that they can, their oil for their own um, good. And there's all these things that are is just the ripple effect of hey, what would have it really taken to maintain a presence there that allowed and gave the Afghan army the uh, ability to keep this stalemate going where it might be forever. But I just feel, I feel, and people have told me that it really does seem like, uh, especially now the, uh, we're going to lose a lot more, um, for, by go going back in there now when we could have either, uh, done nothing and, or just slowly gotten people out, which was what was, it wasn't like there was no plan. There was a plan. There are lots of people are coming out now, you know, that are saying, no, we've, <laughs> I spent years putting together, you know, exit plans and how to get people out. And they decided to do it. And I sometimes wonder if it's because it was so close to the September 11, um, uh, re uh, 20 year, um, anniversary where Biden, um, you know, delusionally thought, oh, we're going to be able to say on September 11 that we are gone and it has been a success and mission accomplished. If he thought that he got bad information or made a bad decision because that same anniversary is what probably gave, I mean, that is a victory, um, date in mm -hmm. the eyes of, uh, jihadists and terrorist groups and, you know, some of the more fanatical Afghans. That is like a battle cry. So the timing of this couldn't have been worse either. So um, I don't know, I'm kind of all over the map. But no, this is all great because the, the last point that you brought up there is who was trying to get our troops out by the 20th anniversary of 9-11 appealing to stateside? Who exactly was that, that appealing to? Which I think this played into, this is the latest iteration of the horrible marketing problem. I don't mean that to be dismissive of what was going on over there. But, you know, I don't think Bush, Obama, or Trump did a great job of communicating exactly what we were doing when we were doing it. And the same goes to the generals and the rest of the Joint Chiefs. But with, with, with Trump... And then on into Biden, all they had to say is, guys, this is not war in the way that you're thinking about war. This is not World War One, where we're all going to line up on either side and charge each other or that we're just going to carpet bomb the area. That's not what we're dealing with, because why did it take this situation in Afghanistan for the general public in the United States to know that we haven't lost a soldier in Afghanistan for a year and a half? And that doesn't make that person's sacrifice in the person's life that was lost a year and a half ago any less important. It's like, why did we continuously hear people? Like even a guy that's in my foxhole, one of my personal buddies called me. He's like, well, you know, at least these endless wars are stopping. And he didn't realize that we still had troops in Germany and in Korea and in Japan and that we hadn't taken any of these casualties. So with... Is it a marketing problem that kind of got us in this position? Is it just overzealous politicians? Like, you know, everything's going bad for Biden right now. Seemingly, the country seems to be in disarray. Was this some feather in his cap? Like, can you figure out maybe where the problem maybe started? I I can only speculate, but I will say, and I think everybody agrees that the uh, the Democratic side of our of uh, the Democratic Party is uh, much more effective at their getting the word out and firing up people in, um, for, you know, with uh, whether it's their message or propaganda or whatever um, over the conservatives. And so if you consider that, someone might have been looking at this as, hey, we can do this. this is going to be an amazing thing that we can do. And they just not knowing the situation at all, just the idea that, yeah, like the magazine covers um, blurb, we're out 20 years later and we're out or mission accomplished. I mean, whatever they might have been thinking, I just... It's obviously totally um, misinformed and um, and uh, ignorant if you really look at what the situation is there. And history, we just look at history. We already know that, we already knew that, you know, it's uh, the graveyard of empires. We know this. We weren't trying to turn it into, a, um, into our empire. And we weren't trying to do anything more than I think maintain a semblance of, of freedom for the average Afghan person. And at the end of the day, they totally blew it. They completely blew it. They had such an opportunity. They could have gotten out all these people 
I mean, I think that they've said there's like there's a growing list. Um, the CIA analyst said he knew of 14,000 people. And then Trump says, I mean, I'm sorry. And then Biden says, um, well, we've accepted 2000. It's like, that's nothing. I mean, that that could have supported, you know, uh, maybe the Kandahar region uh, for <laughs> if if that. Um, and it's just uh it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And I think that what's different about this situation right now is that the mainstream media can't ignore it. It's really hard for them to spin it in a way that will, uh, it's, it's like that he's going to have to come to, um, the reckoning of, of what he did. And that was, you know, my concern with, uh, with this administration as a journalist, because, uh, freedom of speech and the, and the, the media as a watchdog is the most important aspect, I think, of what keeps a government in check and in the freedom of speech, uh, you know, censorship, whatever. And in, you could just watch it, didn't matter what side you were on, but in the election process, in the, you know, running up to the election, uh, the media was very much, uh, in the mass media was very much spinning everything positive and hiding things that were negative about Biden. And that didn't happen on the other side. You, you still heard about everything. And I guess that's what, you know, was interesting with, with COVID. Um, you know, I, as a journalist, it gave me an opportunity to watch all the media, to watch CNN, to watch MSNBC, to watch Fox, and then the various online outlets. And you could look at them every day. And I did. I watched them every day. I watched the entire Republican National Convention and the Democratic National Convention. And it could not have been more different in how it was reported and their messaging and uh, of, of what was reality for someone less than myself who did take the time to watch both sides and someone who strives for balance as a journalist. And that's been lost. But in this case, it's so big that it can't be hidden. It can't be spun. And um, I think that it shows some people that it, there is a serious, there are deep flaws within the Biden administration, um, either for their uh, decision making, their the communication. Uh, I mean, look at the chaos that it's, and they would say before that there's chaos in the Trump administration. Well, the Biden administration just created chaos. They've created chaos on the southern border. That's, you know, it's coming up to this. Uh, the wide open borders. I have friends and um, contacts in the uh, border patrol industry. They're letting anybody they want that comes to the border across without COVID testing, without any real screening. Um, and then once they're here, then they're looking into it. And I mean, that is just, it's wrong. Countries, all countries, even countries like as America that say, hey, come, come bring all and you know make your american dream find your american dream yeah but you know what they all do it legally there is a process and to show the fact to show how right now all these people who actually helped america basically proved it you know and what they often do for uh, for an immigrant is they say hey if you serve in the military you can get your citizenship well there's a boatload of Afghans that have served them America and want to come to America and they've paid their dues and they've taken their risks and they've put their families and themselves in jeopardy for all these years and they can't even get on a plane to get here. Yet, if they somehow could have gotten to uh, Mexico and then the Baja Peninsula or into Texas, they could have walked across the border illegally. It just does not make sense. Yeah, there's a lot of things there that we unfortunately don't have the time to get into, but you did mention something with the mainstream media, Eric. That's something that I'm paying very, very close attention to because in the first really 48 hours or so since Sunday, since we've kind of been sitting in this this milieu of craziness, yeah. I am seeing even left-wing sources being not, not terribly apologetic or, I mean, they're challenging the Biden administration. Right. They're challenging Joe Biden. They're asking, where is Joe? So Joe came and popped down from vacation for 20 minutes, read off a teleprompter, a statement that someone else wrote, and then hopped back on a helicopter, go to Camp David. I'm going to yeah. be watching very close attention to that, but I know you got to go here in just a second. So I do want to wrap up with this question here. Again, you've spent a lot of times, a lot of time with Gold Star families, right? You, you spent a lot of time in a gold star family, which led to the greatest book, my favorite book that I've ever read, Fearless. And you, you spent time with these families and you spent time you know, shedding tears with them and on your own, reflecting on them. 
So if you're a gold star family right now and you lost your spouse or your dad or your brother or, or someone overseas to, to Afghanistan and now you're seeing what you're seeing now in the country, what is your message to those people? Because I'm a very pessimistic guy. I'm not super like rah, rah, it's okay, let's make it better. Especially right now, I'm finding it very, very hard to find the positive. So what would you say to those families? Well, uh, off the cuff like this with a with a quick fired off question, I I just have to look at it and say, hey, at a personal level, uh, the American soldier, uh, humanitarian worker, uh, nurses and doctors who have gone there to help deliver babies, everything, uh, they have connected with um, the Afghan people at a personal level. Adam Brown sharing, you know, he could have brought anything or uh, done anything, but he asked his parents to send, they, he, they asked him what he wanted for Christmas one year. And he said, send me shoes, little kids shoes and socks, because a lot of these kids don't have shoes and it's cold. And he took the time while out on patrol to find kids that were wearing sandals or whatever in cold weather and put the, the, them on. So for people like Adam, uh, Jefferson Donald Davis and Dan Pettitore, uh, the first special forces who were killed in Afghanistan, in Southern Afghanistan, um, right after 9-11, you know, they connected with the kids and the youth and they saw what real America is all about. And that love is conveyed. And I think that, you know, to give um, your life for another is the greatest deed, right? You say that for your, your brother, your sisters in, in arms, but also um, at the end of the day, it's how, what, what more of a humble, uh, kind, and uh, compassionate and brave thing to do than to look past yourself and go fight for someone else's freedom. Uh, maybe someone who is you know, not from your country, that's the ultimate. And so I would say for everybody out there who is looking in disillusion at this, their sons and daughters did make a difference and have made a difference um, in the world. And the freedoms that they've helped to instill in the, in the Afghans now, might help give them if there is a resistance at some point they it gave a whole generation of people a taste of freedom that they might not have had before and i feel like that is something that can't be lost um it, that will need help uh and again we could have continued that into another generation or two which could have helped even more but sadly it's it was cut short that process uh but at the end of the day that's the family i haven't even contacted the families because i know they're they've got to be hurting and I know they're getting reached out by so many people. I'm giving them a few days before I reach mm -hmm. out to just say, I'm so sorry what's been going on. But I know that most of them, all of them are proud of what they, they did. Um, and, uh, you know, they're scratching their heads like the rest of us about how this all went about and how this has all gone down. It's a very unfortunate situation, but I'm glad you spent a little bit of time with us, giving a little bit of, bit of a bit, a little bit of perspective on this. So even now, like I'm getting tongue tied because I'm just, I'm frustrated just like you are. I'm mad just like you are. And I can't imagine what those families are going through. And I feel like I haven't even given enough consideration to that. And so we'll certainly be doing that as much as possible. But Eric, thanks so much for coming back on. Yeah. At a personal level, they made a difference.